On February 24, 2022, Russian forces, on the orders of Russian President Vladimir Putin, launched a large-scale military invasion of Ukraine. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, knowing that his nation would be overwhelmed without additional aid, sought international support. To bolster the numbers of the Ukrainian military, Zelensky authorized the formation of the International Legion of Territorial Defense of Ukraine, made up of foreign volunteers who are willing to fight for Ukrainian sovereignty, lifting visa requirements to foreign volunteers on March 1st. The idea behind the International Legion is nothing new. Many nations employ foreign nationals within their military in specialized units, including the Nepalese Gurkhas, who served under the British military, as well as the famous French Foreign Legion, which has been a mainstay of the French Armed Forces for centuries. Historically, units of foreigners would often be formed in times of war, such as the international brigades during the Spanish Civil War. In Ukraine, the process of organizing, equipping, and deploying non-nationals was made easier due to the experience with similarly compiled units, such as the Georgian Legion, which was formed in the aftermath of the 2014 Donbas conflict. After the organization of the Foreign Legion, Dmitry Kuleba, Ukraine's foreign minister, announced over social media that the nation would accept volunteers from anywhere in the world who are willing to fight against the Russian invasion. For those who were interested in joining the International Legion, a seven-step process was initiated. The prospective recruits would contact the Ukrainian embassy in their home nation, either in person or via telephone or email, letting their intentions of joining the Legion know. They would then make note to the embassy with what documentation they have, like visas or military service, medical or law enforcement records, as well as any other pertinent documents that might be requested by the defense attaché. If accepted, the prospective recruit would then interview in person at the embassy, and then file an application for the contract-based service under the command of the Ukrainian military. They would also be asked what equipment they could provide for themselves or what gear they would need, including clothing, body armor, medical gear, or any other needed supplies, though they would often be forbidden from bringing weapons of their own. Weapons, usually in the form of the AK-74 assault rifle, would be provided once in Ukraine, which could be supplemented with anti-tank weaponry if the volunteer had experience with it. Arrangements would then be made to travel to Ukraine, usually through Poland. Once in Ukraine, the recruits would then be gathered through designated staging areas, where they would sign the contract to join the Ukrainian armed forces, after which the recruits would be formed into units and sent to repel the Russian invasion. The recruits would be paid a wage which was capped at 7,000 hryvnias, the base pay of a Ukrainian soldier. This was to avoid breaking international law, which forbids paying of mercenaries more than a regular soldier and to dissuade adventure seekers and those hoping to profit from the conflict. We don't need mercenaries who think they may make some money or something like that, states Anton Mironovich, a spokesman for Ukraine's armed forces. The situation was much more chaotic in the earlier phases of the conflict. Due to the influx of volunteers, estimates range between 16 to 20,000. The recruits would be gathered in staging areas where they would be divided into two groups, those with prior military experience and those without. Those who lacked any sort of military training at all were sent on a hastily assembled boot camp lasting four weeks, a far cry from the eight to 12 weeks that's typical in most armed forces. The others would be formed into improvised units under the command of the Ukrainian officer and then sent to the front lines. As can be imagined, this hurried assembled system led to a degree of confusion and mixed performance in combat. One of the first trials by fire done by the International Legion was a defense against the initial push into Kiev in the early March. Many of the units performed well, but a large portion of the Legion was discharged in the aftermath of the fighting due to their inexperience in a modern combined arms conflict. On April 1st, recruitment was temporarily halted to organize the process and, more pertinently, to separate those with military experience from those without, since inexperienced soldiers would be more of a liability than an asset in a combat environment. We should only take experienced combat veterans. That's the lesson we're learning," stated one Ukrainian general. The others don't know what they're getting themselves into, and when they find out, they want to go home. We need specialized skills, especially snipers. Volunteers from around the world have joined the International Legion, including many combat veterans from the United States, the United Kingdom, and Canada, who have fought in Afghanistan, Iraq, and other combat zones in the global war on terror. 
There are also a significant portion of soldiers who have arrived from Poland and the Baltic countries who are concerned with Russian expansion in the region. And many of those who have joined are the ethnic Ukrainians fighting for their ancestral homeland, while others are simply fighting for a cause that they believe in. The International Legion is not without controversy. Many countries have discouraged citizens from joining, citing the inherent dangers of entering an active combat environment. There are also questions about the legality of volunteering for a foreign military. Under British law, it's illegal for a British citizen to fight in a military against a nation that the British government is at peace with. Though this law hasn't been enforced since the 19th century. In a similar fashion, US law forbids groups from entering conflicts against a nation that the United States is at peace with. Though individuals are permitted to join independently. In many nations, fighting in the name of a foreign military nation is punishable by the loss of citizenship. And to combat this, there's an ongoing discussion in the Ukrainian parliament about granting Ukrainian citizenship to those who have fought. In spite of the risk, volunteers from over 50 countries have joined Ukraine in an attempt to blunt Russian aggression. As can be imagined, the logistical realities of arming and equipping such a force have been a challenge for the Ukrainian government. Many of the volunteers will be clothed in Ukrainian army uniforms, but a patchwork of military clothing has been utilized as many simply brought their own gear from home. There are also reports that many legionnaires were requesting equipment from private donations, including body armor, helmet, night vision, goggles, and other supplies. Using private Facebook groups and other social media to coordinate the delivery of said supplies. The International Legion is primarily an infantry force, as more specialized combat roles require very specific training that would be very extensive and take way too long to complete, given the urgent nature of the conflict. Members of the Legion, like all members of the Ukrainian military, wear blue or yellow arm pads as identification markers, which is mostly to differentiate themselves from the Russian forces whose weapons and equipment are very similar to the Ukrainian counterparts, and it helps avoid friendly fire incidents. These armbands also serve to denote the legionnaires as legitimate combatants. According to the Geneva Convention, soldiers are only afforded protections if they're in uniform. And due to an ad hoc nature of the legion's organization, there's a variety of uniforms and patterns, uh, which on their own could be construed as foreign mercenaries, not covered under the convention's protection. Most of the International Legion is equipped with the ubiquitous AK-74, which is the standard rifle used by both the Ukrainian and Russian militaries. It's an updated version of the famous AK-47. The rifle is chambered in 5.45 by 39 mm and is select fire, being capable of shooting either semi or fully automatic. In addition, there are other variants of the AK series utilized in the conflict, including the classic AK-47 and the AKM, both chambered in 7.62 by 39 mm. The International Legion also has been carrying a wide range of other firearms, including the Fabrique Nationale FNC. This Belgian-made rifle was originally a replacement for the FN SCAR and is chambered in the NATO standard 5.56x45mm cartridge. It's select fire, capable of shooting semi or fully automatic. A reported 3,000 of these weapons were given to Ukraine by Belgium at the outbreak of the conflict, and many have found their way into the hands of the International Legion. There have been a plethora of other small arms in use, from American-made M4s and M14s to the Belgian-made FN SCAR L and others have been seen in the combat zone as well, with many of the volunteers using whatever they could scrounge, especially in the earlier stages of the invasion. As the Russian military is a mechanized force, there is a great need for infantry weapons that can defeat military vehicles. These include man pads or man portable air defense systems, which are basically shoulder-mounted missile launchers designed to shoot down airborne targets. Some examples include the American-made FIM-92 Stinger, which is a heat-seeking missile with an engagement range of up to 15,000 feet in altitude. The Polish-made Grom-M, which is likewise a heat-seeking missile with a much shorter range. There are also numerous anti-tank weapon systems in use, including the American-made FGM-148 Javelin and the British-slash-Swedish-made M-Law, which is easier to operate but it has a, a much shorter range. Many of these weapons were already in use by the Ukrainian military, but at the outbreak of the invasion, there was an influx in international aid and military hardware. Many of these more advanced weapon systems are not used by the volunteers, as they require extensive training to be utilized effectively. Again, something that the volunteers happen to lack. 
One of the first and most tragic incidents in the short history of the International Legion was the attack on the Yavoriv military base, located about 10 kilometers from the Polish border, around 30 kilometers northwest of Lviv. On March 13th, the base was hit by a salvo of over 30 missiles, killing a report of 35 and wounding 134. According to Russian sources, over 180 foreign mercenaries were killed in the attack. At the time of the strike, around 1,000 foreign volunteers were located at the base, which was used as a processing and a training facility for the International Legion. According to a German witness, the death toll could be over 100, as the figures reported were only Ukrainian casualties. It is very difficult to track the precise movements of the International Legion and its constituent units, but it's been sent to the major theaters of operation in the conflict to bolster the Ukrainian forces that are already engaged there, including the Donbas region in Kiev, which helped to blunt the Russian offensive against the city. They also participated in the liberation of the town of Irpin, a city surrounding Kiev, providing extra manpower to the beleaguered Ukrainian forces 